Wonderful. And if you could give me a, a warning when I've got 15 minutes left, that'd be great. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we are ready to start. So the, the next talk and the last of this uh, of this whole conference will be by Robert Speckens, and he will be talking about adjudicating between different causal accounts of bail inequality violations. Please. Great, thank you. Uh, so I, I know it's been a, a, a long day, lots of talks before this one. So first of all, thanks for you know, sticking around to, to the end. And of course, thanks to the uh, organizers for uh, allowing people such as myself to participate uh, virtually in the conference. Uh, it's been really interesting. So, um, you know, the, this, this conference has really been about the interplay between the field of causal inference and the field of quantum foundations. Um, and, uh, you know, at Perimeter Institute, we've been you know, interested in this interplay for a while now. And I would say there's sort of a, a rough categorization of projects. There's some projects where we're Sort of using ideas from quantum foundations, uh, expertise on Bell's theorem, for example, to try to improve uh, uh, state-of-the-art techniques and causal inference, or you know, an answer some interesting questions for causal inference people. Uh, but then there's also projects wherein we sort of try to take the ideas and conceptual framework that have been developed in the field of causal inference and see, you know, uh, how we can use them to, you know, better understand problems in the foundations of quantum theory. Uh, so, you know, earlier th this week, you heard about some of the, the work at, at Perimeter that was sort of about this arrow from, from Ellie and from Beata. Uh, and, and this talk is going to be about uh, the, the other arrow. Um, and so first of all, I want to sort of draw an analogy between two dichotomies. Uh, so, you know, in the field of causal inference, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's uh, maybe an, an older perspective that's been overturned, that maybe there was a time where people thought that, you know, uh, if you give me the data table, just the statistics, then that has all the information, you know, about answering questions that one is interested in. But I think, you know, the, the, the causal inference work has shown that, uh, you know, two different causal hypotheses with the same data can lead to very different conclusions. So there, there's more to be specified than, than just the statistical data. And, and there's a similar kind of dichotomy uh, over on the quantum side where there's, you know, uh, a certain a set of researchers who are, are inclined to think that, you know, one can get away with just talking about the operational predictions of quantum theory and what sort of data we see in different experiments. Uh, and then there are other researchers who think that, no, you know, we, we need to talk about the realist interpretation of the formalism. We need, uh, you know, there, there are concepts that are not just defined in terms of the operational statistics um, and that it's only with that sort of uh, realist lens that we can really understand uh, what, what the statistics is telling us. So I, I'm of that persuasion. And so this talk is, is going to be uh, to some extent about, you know, achieving realism in, in quantum theory. Um, and, you know, one of the things that learning about causal inference has, has done for me is it, it, it's really changed my views about the foundation of quantum mechanics. Um, and, you know, an idea that I think comes out of it is, is that perhaps the, the essence of achieving realism in quantum theory is, is really to, to recognize that there's sort of a minimal core of, of realism that you should seek to salvage, uh, which is just that statistical correlations need to have a causal explanation, right? So often when people talk about realist interpretation of quantum theory, they, they mean a lot more than that. And, and the idea I'm gonna pursue here is that like may, maybe this is what we really need to do to achieve realism. And hopefully by the end, I can say you know, a bit more about what I, what I mean by that. Um, but that, that's the basic idea. And of course the, the challenge is that uh, Bell's theorem and, and other examples that are like Bell's theorem involving different causal structures, like the triangle and the instrumental structure, uh, they, they pose a challenge, I would say, to providing causal explanations of, of correlations. Um, so uh, let, let's, you know, we've seen this over and over, the, the Bell's theorem, but let me just sort of set up my uh, notation. And, uh, you know, this is what a Bell experiment looks like. And uh, it's going to give you some statistical data. So this is just a data table where I run over the, the four possible settings and the, and the four possible outcomes. This is the kind of statistics you, you could see for particular choices of uh, preparations and measurements and predicted by quantum theory, this is possible. Uh, and so the, the, the most natural causal hypothesis you might think of is, is just this one that Bell wrote down, that there's some common cause that explains the correlations between those outcomes. Um, and that is natural because if you look at the structure of the experiment, it looks very much like that's what's going on, that these two particles are really uh, what causes those outcomes to be correlated. Um, but as, as we've seen before, if I try to model that hypothesis uh, as, a, as a causal model, right? So this is the, the DAG that represents the causal structure. 
So in my talk, S and T are the names of the setting variables, X and Y are the names of the outcome variables. And I stipulate parameters. So these are the conditional probabilities for every variable given its parents. And I compute what the possible conditionals X, Y given ST are. Uh, then I find that, that these are not arbitrary probabilities, but they satisfy certain constraints. In particular, there's the no signaling constraints. So uh, what you can infer about X given S and T doesn't depend on T at all. Uh, and similarly, the vice versa, which we know in, in the causal inference community get summarized by these uh, relations here, X independent T given, given S. So th those are called no signaling as we've seen. And then the other constraint of course is uh, bell type inequality. So here I have the CHSH inequality because the outcomes and settings are binary. Uh, and it says this, this combination of the conditional probabilities bounded above by three quarters. So, uh, you know, going back to the data, this hypothesis implies the bell inequalities. This data I've chosen as a uh, data that violates the bell inequalities. It actually achieves the sort of maximal violation, which is called the Cyrilson bound. Um, and so these guys are incompatible and you can conclude that it's definitely, this is not a valid causal explanation of, of that data. Okay, so that's, that's the, the well-known bit. And so that this talk is more about, well, how can we explain this statistical data? You know, it's not this way, but uh, what kinds of causal explanations could we hope to give? And so there, there are, you know, many ideas that, that we've heard about in some of the, the previous talks, like uh, Sally and Eric's talk, where, you know, there, there might be a super determinist explanation or retro causation. Uh, much of what I'm gonna say is, is true for sort of all, all attempts like that, but I'm gonna focus in on this one. This is the one where there's a, a causal inference from uh, the setting on one wing to the outcome on the other wing. Uh, so we saw this in, in Tim's talk. And I, I would say that uh, for a certain set of people, th this is kind of the default, the most natural uh, causal explanation of, of the Bell inequality violation. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on it. Um, okay, so it's certainly compatible with the data. Uh, and the reason for that is that you know, re relative to Bell's model, uh, now the parameter that describes how Y depends on its parents includes the possibility of a dependence on S. So that changes what sorts of distributions I can see. And the only constraint that this distribution satisfy for, for this causal structure is that I still have that no signaling from the right to the left. So for all choices of these parameters, I'm gonna see that no signaling condition, but I can recover the sort of appearance of no signaling uh, or this independence relation uh, left to right for particular choices of these parameters. And similarly, although there are no inequality constraints that are implied by this, I can uh, choose these parameters in such a way that I get uh, to the Cyrilson bound or lower than the Cyrilson bound. I, I can respect it for certain choices of those parameters. So that, that's the idea of how this sort of causal explanation works. Uh, and uh, John Barrett actually uh, already sort of explained what I had intended to explain here that, you know, if you ask yourself, how, how can no signaling, this uh, independences that we see be consistent with the existence of this causal arrow, uh, well, it's, it's ultimately just this idea of the Burnham cipher or the one-time pad, which is that, uh, you know, the cipher text can be a sum mod two of the plain text in the key. And as long as the key is uniformly distributed, uh, when I compute the, the conditional of cipher text given plain text, I find it's, it's also uniformly distributed. So it has no dependence on, on the plain text. So I get this independence of the cipher text and the plain text, even though T is clearly a cause of the cipher text because obviously if I learn the, the key, I can infer the plain text from the cipher text. Um, so that's essentially the idea by which these sorts of causal explanations that I've been talking about work. So if you look at something called the Bacon Toner model of Bell inequality violations, where they sort of asked about how to simulate it with classical communication, it uses this, this Vernum cipher idea where you sort of uh, wash out the T dependence by adding noise. And if you look at the Bohmian model, which as Tim pointed out, in, involves these sorts of causal arrows, it, it works in exactly the same way, the same sort of washing out phenomena. Uh, so that, so it's it basically, it's about choosing the, the parameters here uh, carefully so that you can get that, that washing out. Okay, so I would mention uh, just that, you know, these kinds of explanations already have a kind of, a, something uncomfortable about them, which is that um, if you thought that relativity implied not only that signals shouldn't go faster than light, but also that causal influences shouldn't go faster than light, then, then because these, experiments can be done such that the wings are spaced like separated, you know, this causal influence seems to be in tension with that aspect of relativity. Um, so I'm not, I'm not gonna focus on that, but that's the, the usual reason given for maybe being uncomfortable with this, this sort of causal explanation. Uh, and in this talk, I'm, I'm gonna be focusing on, on other reasons to perhaps not be happy with that causal explanation. Um, but 
Before getting into that, uh, I want to talk about the uh, a second possibility for a causal account. So again, this is something we've uh, seen at various points in, in other talks uh, under the name of you know, quantum causal model. So the basic idea is to say the causal structure that Bell wrote down was right, but um, we're going to have some, something go exotic, namely that there's going to be something like a quantum common cause here. So, so the way I, I want to formalize that for the purpose of this talk is, is to say that the parameters that we're going to add on to the causal structure aren't uh, conditional probabilities anymore. So they're more exotic mathematical objects. Um, so uh, Matt Leifer and I called these conditional density operators. So they're operators on a, a tensor product of the Hilbert spaces of, of the different uh, labels here. Um, but you know, they, so like row AB here will be a joint state on uh, uh, quantum systems A and B. And this row X given SA is basically a measurement on A. It's a way of representing the measurement that you do on A with outcome X and, and setting variable S. And then there's, uh, you can prove that, uh, you know, if you take the product of these conditional density operators and you trace over A and B, so this is the analog of summing over the uh, lambda variable, the, the, the latent variable in the causal model, uh, you can compute the conditional probability of X and Y given S and, and T. Um, and so this, uh, you know, the, this kind of formalism is uh, developed in this paper with Matt Leifer, as I mentioned, but there's, there's a number of other uh, articles that are, do more for describing, you know, what, what is a quantum causal model. So I think we, we've uh, heard uh, from about all, all of these. Uh, and there are some differences among these proposals, but, but they're not really going to be relevant for, for what I'm saying here. Um, the, the important thing is that if, if you look at the constraints that are implied on this probability distribution of outcomes given settings, uh, you recover the no signaling constraints for all choices of the parameters. So no matter what conditional density operators you put in here, you recover these. And maybe I should mention for the quantum folks that this conditional density operator, uh, you know, although it, it showed up in John's talk, I'll, I'll just remind you that it, it's the Jamalkowski isomorphic operator to the completely positive map that takes A and S to X. Um, so right, the, the uh, conditional probability respects the no signaling uh, for all the parameters. And furthermore, as I vary over these choices of parameters, uh, I get uh, all and only the, the probability distributions that respect uh, Cyrilson's bound. So you can get up to 85% here rather than the, the three quarters of the bell bound. Um, so this, this is also compatible with the data. Uh, and, and so the question is now, which, which of these causal explanations should we prefer? Um, and so that's most of what I want to talk about, which is, you know, can we give reasons for preferring one or the other of these? Uh, and let me just emphasize what the difference is here. So uh, they, they both are radical in one sense, but the one on the left here is, is radical on the causal structure, right? So it says that there's this surprising influence uh, that, you know, is, it can be superluminal, for example. Um, whereas this one is conservative on the causal structure. But if we go to the parameters in the model, this one's conservative. It's just plain vanilla classical probability theory that we use for making inferences about uh, these uh, variables that are latent. Whereas over here, the claim is that it's that uh, formalism that we use to make inferences that has become radical and, and exotic. And you know, the, the nature of the latent system uh, also can't be thought of as just a, a set uh, like we could here. Um, okay, so, so that's the question. Uh, and I'm gonna address it in two ways. The, the first is gonna be via you know, thinking about empirical adequacy, and, and the second is gonna be more uh, theoretical. Uh, so yeah, this part of the talk is basically about trying to do what Bell did, which is you know, ask whether an experiment can decide this sort of, of question. So I should say this is, uh, I'm gonna be reporting on an experiment that was done at the University of Waterloo in Kevin Rush's lab. Uh, Patrick Daly was the PhD student uh, who did the experiment and, and most of the data analysis. And uh, I was checking today and the, the article just came out on the FizzRev A website six hours ago. So I was able to give you the actual reference. Okay, so the, the key thing here is gonna be, um, you know, what we mean by empirical adequacy. And I wanna contrast what we're doing with, uh, I think a, a, maybe a tendency in quantum foundations over the years to, to have too low a bar on, on what's a satisfactory explanation. Uh, I think a lot of times we think of, you know, oh, if I give a, a model or a realist interpretation, all I really got to show is that I can reproduce the uh, statistical predictions of the formalism, uh, or you know, just I have to show that I don't underfit the data. So uh, you know, if if in a simple example, if I just have uh, two variables uh, that are related linearly, this is you know the ground truth. 
And then I collect some data which has statistical fluctuations. So these, these blue dots are, are the, the data points I've collected. Uh, then I could you know, fit a linear model to this uh, and compute the chi-squared, you know, the sums of the squares of the differences to give me some, some notion of how good this model is at, at fitting this data. Um, and if I instead look at a polynomial model, uh, I can again find the, the best fit polynomial, the one that minimizes this chi-squared error. Uh, and if both of them have pretty good chi-squares, I can say, well, they, they both do a good job. They're, neither one of them underfits the data. So in that sense, they're both satisfactory. And perhaps if I wanted to prefer one of them, I might say, well, I'll prefer the one that gives me the, the lower chi-squared. You know, it does a, a better job of fitting the data. But of course, you know, this is not the end of the story with regard to statistical model selection. There's obviously a higher bar that you might want to achieve, which is, you know, what's the predictive power of your model? So in particular, you know, a model can lack predictive power, not only by uh, underfitting the data, but by overfitting it as well. So uh, let me sort of remind you what overfitting is about. So again, yeah, go back to this example. Uh, if I take my data and I divide it into a training set and a test set, then I could use the training data, which has some statistical fluctuations to, to do my fits to the model. So this is what my best fit linear model looks like for that training data. And then I'll, I'll just call the chi-squared uh, the training error in that case. Uh, and then for the polynomial model, I can also compute the training error. Um, and now uh, the key is that I, I evaluate these models based on data that I haven't used to, to find the best fit. So that, that's where the test data comes in. So here's the test data, it has different statistical fluctuations. And now I define the test error to be the chi-squared uh, between uh, the, the test data and my best fit linear model. So that's the test error for my linear model. And if I look at my polynomial model, I do the same thing. That's my test error for the polynomial model. Um, and so you know, when you compare the linear model to the polynomial model, uh, you see clearly that the linear model does a better job of predicting the data that it hasn't seen. It has a, a, a smaller test error than does the polynomial model. Um, and so it's the preferred model. And, and you notice that the sort of a, a signature of the fact that the polynomial model is overfitting the data is that it has gotten a lower training error at the expense of a, a higher test error. And, and the, basically what's going on here is that it's using that extra parametric freedom that it has to mistake statistical fluctuations for real features. And then it fits to those statistical fluctuations as if they were real features. And that means it predicts the data it hasn't seen uh, worse than the, uh, the model that doesn't have that extra parametric freedom. Um, okay, so that's uh, what we're gonna do. We're gonna use a kind of train and test methodology to try to adjudicate between this, this pair of, of causal accounts. Um, so the uh, experiment we did was just, you know, a basic Bell experiment with binary outcome measurements, uh, two qubit entangled states, but uh, there's gonna be actually five measurement settings on each wing. So it's not the simple CHSH setup. Uh, it's it's a, a bit more elaborate than that. So there's you know, 25 uh, measurements in total, each, each has four possible outcomes. So we collect relative frequencies of those four possible outcomes for each of those 25 setups, uh, put that into a big data table, and then uh, basically try to find you know, the best fit parameters uh, in this model to reproduce those relative frequencies. So try to minimize the distance to those relative frequencies for the probability of XY given ST that we obtain. And similarly, we, we vary you know, the parameters in this model, trying to get the best fit for that same uh, frequency data. Um, this, is, this is the experimental setup. It's just a, a basic uh, situation where you encode the two qubits and polarization degrees of freedom of, of single photons and use wave plates to vary among the measurements. Um, OK, so these, these are the results. Uh, so over here uh, on the left, I've, I've plotted uh, you know, these bars represent the training error and the test error of this. Uh, structurally radical but parametrically conservative model. And on the right, it's the training error and the test error for this structurally conservative but parametrically radical model. Uh, and you'll notice that, that this one has more predictive power. It has a, a smaller test error. But furthermore, you see that you know, this model has a smaller training error, which suggests that the reason it has the worst, the wor a worst test error is because it's overfitting. And so uh, when we looked into it, what the uh, conclusion we came to is that, yes, it's overfitting the data. And, and the reason is as follows, that the data, because it's you know, finite run, it's you know, not an infinite run of data, uh, although in principle you would have expected the distribution of the outcome y to be independent of the setting, there are statistical fluctuations away from that. So for different values of the setting on the left, you get slightly different relative frequencies uh, for the, the outcomes on the right uh, for different t values. And so over here, you can mistake that statistical fluctuation for a real feature, 
And the best fit model can now have Y uh, depending a little bit uh, on X, having a little bit of signaling. So it can mistake those fluctuations for actual signaling. And so the best fit model can incorporate a bit of that signaling. And then when you ask it to predict the test data, which involves different statistical fluctuations, uh, it does worse because you know, that signaling is not really there uh, in the data. Whereas this model over here has no possibility, uh, none of the, the parameters I can choose will ever yield any violation of the no signaling criteria because it's always enforced by, by all the choices of parameters. Okay, so the, the, the conclusion is that this uh, model is disfavored by uh, this experimental data. It, it has worse predictive power. Um, so this, this uh, ultimately supports the conclusion of this uh, paper that I wrote with Chris Wood some years ago that uh, was mentioned in a couple of talks about how uh, uh, models that violate faithfulness uh, uh, don't provide good explanations. Uh, the difference here is that we haven't assumed the principle of faithfulness. It's instead, this train and test method is basically just disfavoring any unfaithful classical ca causal models based on the fact that they tend to overfit the data. Um, so that is very similar you know, for the causal inference crowd. There's this paper on uh, Bayesian causal discovery by Heckerman et al, where they, they make the same point that rather than using a kind of threshold scheme where you have to set an arbitrary arbitrarily decide whether some data respects independences or not, and then uh, you know, ask whether it faithfully reproduces uh, the, the data. Instead, you, you sort of uh, allow, you, know, you use the actual deviation from independence to, to get an estimate of how likely uh, a given DAG was to have generated that data. So we're, we're sort of implementing faithfulness implicitly in the same way that this Bayesian causal discovery uh, scheme would have done. Um, so I just want to note here that, you know, uh, contra to what Tim Maudlin said in his talk, um, you know, that there is an argument here about faithfulness, not, not simply an attempt to tar some idea by choosing unflattering terminology. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, that, that was uh, what, what Tim was talking about. I, th I think there's, it would have been more interesting if, if uh, we had discussed, you know, the, the content of the uh, assumption of faithfulness and, and not just the terminology. Uh, but I do want to get to uh, to address Tim's point about Bohmian mechanics. So for that, I want to introduce uh, a, a distinction among these kinds of classical causal models. Um, so I want to say that uh, you know uh, a classical causal model is parameter unrestricted if I allow any conditional probability distribution here among the parameters. Um, and so you know in this case, that's what allows me to to violate no signaling. Um, but I could also imagine cases where these are now going to be restricted. So, so, you know, in a causal inference context, you know, these might be, you might consider a linear model or Gaussian distributions. Um, but, you know, there's lots of ways you'd implement this restriction and then you may or may not violate the no signaling condition. Um, so one version of that would be what I'll call quantum on the nose model. So Bohm, you know, the standard version of Bohm mechanics would be an example of this, where this restriction has been chosen in such a way that the conditionals you can get here X, Y given ST are all and only the ones that are predicted uh, by quantum theory. Um, and so if you do that, then you can't violate the no signaling condition because you know, the, the formalism of quantum theory doesn't allow you to violate that condition. So you're gonna respect it as well. Um, there's a different way of restricting the parameters, uh, which I'll call you know, quantum extending models. So they include the quantum predictions, but more besides. And so uh, Anthony Valentini has a version of Bohmian mechanics uh, which actually makes different predictions to standard quantum theory. Uh, they do involve a restriction. If I try to cast uh, his version of Bohm mechanics in the, in the mold of a, a causal model, it will be a, a restriction on the kinds of parameters, uh, but not one that gets you precisely to the, the quantum predictions. Um, so it, it has more leeway and therefore it, it can violate you know, signaling and, and Valentini predicts that we should, if, if his version of Bohm mechanics is true, we should be able to see uh, signaling in certain circumstances. Um, okay, so the, the, ex the experiment uh, I described disfavors this first class, right? So anybody who says, oh, it's easy to explain bell inequality violations, I just need to incorporate these interlab causal influences and I don't need to bother to stipulate any model. I think this is a good argument against that position that, that uh, you know, those sorts of explanations tend to overfit the data relative to this idea of a quantum causal model. Um, these quantum extending models like Valentini's version of Bohm mechanics, you know, ex we didn't explicitly consider them uh, in our analysis. So we, we did not encode the specific restriction they imply 
Uh, we didn't even figure out exactly what the, the specific restriction that was implied. So strictly speaking, you know, we, we don't rule this out, but in principle, the kind of technique we described could, if you, if you went and encoded that restriction and you tried to do the experiment in, in the context where Valentini thinks that you really might see signaling, it would be a way of, of testing that idea and finding out whether uh, it really uh, overfits the data relative to the quantum causal model or, or not. Um, but if, if you look at one of these quantum on the nose models, then they strictly speaking have exactly the same predictive power as, as one of these parametrically radical models um, because they satisfy the nose signaling. So they're, they're not gonna be prone to any overfitting uh, because they cannot choose any parameters that, that would yield signaling. So there, this kind of uh, technique that I described is, is not going to be able to rule out the standard version of bone mechanics if you think that the right way of, of formalizing that, that notion in the causal model framework is, is in terms of restriction. So I think, you know, a, Robert, an interesting, yes? Just telling you 15 minutes. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, so it's an interesting question, um, you know, it, what kind of reasons can be given if, if you try to think of bone mechanics from the perspective of this sort of framework for formalizing physical theories? Is there a good reason that can be given in favor of this kind of restriction on the parameters? Um, you know, I think in, in Valentini's version, there's this kind of a story about dynamical equilibrium that uh, achieves uh, a kind of near uh, matching to the quantum predictions. Um, but I, I don't really wanna talk about that today. Uh, instead, I wanna take a, a different kind of tack uh, which is to, to consider not just the standard version of bone mechanics, but really any one of these parameter restricted quantum on the nose uh, causal models. Uh, and I wanna try to give an argument for why we, we should still uh, think that there's a kind of uncomfortable tension between the existence of this causal influence and the fact that we see no signaling from the left to the right. Um, so that's this, this second topic, which is trying to adjudicate between these, these two models, these two types of models, uh, based not on you know, empirical data, but on, on a theoretical principle. So this, this is uh, work that's still uh, not on the archive yet with David Schmidt and John Selby. Um, and it seems to me that there's some uh, close connections to some papers that are already out there, one by Eric Calvaconti and one by Catani and Lupin. Um, okay, so the, the theoretical principle uh, that I'm going to appeal to is uh, what I like to call the Leibnizian methodological principle. Um, so it's a, a methodological principle for how to construct you know, uh, realist theories. And, and the basic idea, it's, I mean, it, it goes back to the principle of sufficient reason, but uh, I, I like to think of it as the, the ontological identity of empirical indiscernibles. Um, so so here's, here's my version of it, which is if, if a realist physical theory posits two scenarios that are empirically indistinguishable in principle, uh, but nonetheless, th those two scenarios are represented as ontologically distinct. Uh, then you should throw this theory out and, and replace it with one where these two scenarios are ontologically the same. That, that's the idea. And you know, the, this in principle here is, is playing an important role that empirical indistinguishability is, is not some parochial notion about like, oh, I just didn't do the experiment well enough. And, and you know, maybe my failings as a human didn't allow me to empirically distinguish them, but it, it really means uh, in principle by the lights of that physical theory. So the physical theory has to say, you know, it could never be dis distinguished even in principle, even with technology one billion years from now, you know, and anything living in the universe subject to its physical laws could not distinguish it. So, so Leibniz used this kind of principle to uh, argue against Newton's notion of absolute space. You know, the argument being that if, you know, you, you move all the particles in absolute space over by five feet, nothing you observe changes at all. And therefore, you know, any theoretical framework that assumes the existence of absolute space runs afoul of this sort of principle. We can't give any reason for why the, the universe should have been here as opposed to there. So it's, it's a bad uh, model of reality. Um, I, I think it's a, a reasonable principle, but if you ask, you know, what, why should you believe it when you're building physical theories? I think the best answer is that uh, it has really impressive credentials. Um, Einstein, I argue, used it. It, it was a, a really important principle in his development of both the special and general theories of relativity. So I, I don't have time to go into why that's the case, but uh, you can read about it in this paper. Um, but basically his argument against the electromagnetic ether in, in the beginning of his 1905 paper is basically an appeal to Leibniz's principle. His, uh, you know, the, the foundation of general relativity, which is the equivalence principle, is also an appeal to Leibniz. And then the, the final obstacle he had to overcome in developing general relativity was understanding something called the whole argument. And uh, I argue in my paper that that's also 
uh, an endorsement of, of Leibniz's principle. So for all those reasons, I think it's, it's an important principle for physicists you know, to take note of and to try to incorporate into their theorizing. Uh, and I'm gonna use a slightly uh, variant of it relative to what I just explained, uh, which is sort of a generalization to the case of physical theories where there might be some uncertainty. So theories like statistical mechanics or, or quantum mechanics, where you, you don't have a description of all uh, you know, the, the fundamental degrees of freedom. And in that context, the, the way uh, it gets used is to say that if you have two states of knowledge concerning operational facts, empirical facts, uh, and they're perhaps different, but equivalent for the purposes of making inferences, they allow you to make exactly the same inferences about other operational facts, then when you try to represent that in your underlying realist theory, so now you're, you're talking about states of knowledge of some underlying facts about reality, uh, that those two states of knowledge should also allow you, you know, sh should um, have you make the same inferences about other uh, realist facts. Um, so this is my attempt to sort of give it a, a you know, make sense of it, but it, really there's a formal definition which you can find in, in this paper. And it would, you know, take too much time to introduce all the formalism to, to really uh, say this properly. But, but hopefully I can uh, make the application of the principle plausible uh, in the context that I, I want to apply it. So here, here's that context. It's, so we're, we're back to the, the Bell experiment. Um, so now I want to imagine a, a slight variation where over here on the right, uh, we, we don't imagine that we just have, say, two settings, like in the CHSH uh, experiment. But we really imagine that we could do any measurement at all uh, on the systems coming into Bob's lab. Um, so that's, that's the change. Um, and, and you know, if we believe quantum theory, then even though I, I do any old measurement I like, I'm still not going to see signaling that the, the choice of the setting over here in Alice's lab is not going to change the, the distribution over the outcomes of it, it for any measurement at all. All right, so if, if I look at uh, the, the causal structure, sorry, uh, the causal structure that's posited uh, in these models that involve the interlab causal influence. So now I've just uh, dropped this T setting variable and just written the outcome here, Y sub M. Um, I can always, you know, without loss of generality, imagine some causal mediator. I'll call it lambda prime, that sort of mediates the influence from the parents of Y on, on Y. Um, okay, so, so I, that's just sort of for convenience. And now the point is that, um, you know, this, this measurement I do over on, on the right-hand system, uh, you know, is, is really, in my realist view, you know, a, a measurement on the properties of this lambda prime causal mediary variable. And it has this feature that, you know, it's the, the outcomes of these measurements are independent of this setting S for all measurements I might do here. And, and that, as I said, is true of if, if you're positing one of these par parameter restricted quantum on the nose models, you're saying that quantum theory gets things right. And quantum theory predicts that you'll see no signaling no matter what measurement you do. So what the Leibnizian methodological principle tells you is that if that's the case, then lambda prime itself should be independent of S. Um, and the reason for that is that if, if it weren't, if different values of S led to different probability distributions over lambda prime, that would mean that you know, learning S would allow me to infer different things about lambda prime you know, for, for different values of S, even though I infer exactly the same things about the outcomes of any measurement. So it'd be an example of, of a difference in the, at the ontological level that had no uh, empirical counterpart. There was no observation that would allow me to see the difference between those di different distributions of, over lambda prime for, for different values of S. Okay, so that's, that's where the, the principle gets applied. So now I can finish the argument. Um, so if, if you want to satisfy this principle, then this fragment, this, this part of our causal structure. So here I've just uh, dropped this piece here. And I've, I've made this circle black because for a moment, I'm gonna sort of be thinking about this as, as if it were observed. Um, so this, this fragment of the causal structure, you know, should, should have a set of parameters describing how every variable depends on its parents uh, that are restricted in such a way that lambda prime comes out independent of S. You know, we, we know that doesn't, that's fine given the, the causal arrow here because we can use a Burnham cipher trick to uh, ensure that independence. But, but that's what we need if we wanna satisfy Leibniz. Uh, and now here's the critical bit. It, it turns out that any distribution over X lambda prime and S that I can get here with this restriction, I could also get in this causal structure where the arrow from S to lambda prime has dropped. And that's because every distribution X lambda prime given S uh, that uh, has this independence is achievable in this DAG. 
So we already saw that at, at the beginning of uh, Robin Evans' talk, because this DAG here, which has a common cause connection between these guys, is observation equivalent to the case where I have an arrow from lambda prime to x. So it's just the collider on x. And you know, it's well known that the collider on x can give you every distribution where the, uh, the causes are independent. So, so any trace of parameters here that gives me some distribution, I can simulate it here. All right, so that means that you know, back, back in my original causal structure, I, I can replace this little fragment here. You know, if it's a Leibnizian model, then this little fragment here can be replaced by the one that doesn't have the arrow. But of course this, uh, I can just drop this causal mediary. This is just the plain old Bell structure again. And so any distribution that is achievable with this model in a Leibnizian way also satisfies the Bell inequalities. Um, so, okay, what's the summary? If you consider these parameter restricted quantum on the nose models with the, with the cause effect influence here, and you demand to respect this principle, you can't recover Bell inequality violations. And therefore, if you have, sorry, if you have a model like this that does recover Bell inequality violations, then it must violate this uh, Leibnizian principle. And that's in fact what, what happens in, in Bowman mechanics, that the, the distribution, like this lambda prime in Bowman mechanics is like the particle configuration over on Bob's side. And the distribution over that variable does indeed depend on uh, the, the setting over analysis lab, even though no measurement you do on it can, can see that difference. Um, so, that, so that's the, the argument as to you know, why you might not be so keen on this causal account. Uh, if you're excited about the Leibnizian methodological principle, I, I think it's an important principle and, and you shouldn't violate it. Uh, if you think this is a problem, then you ought not to be happy with this kind of model. Okay, so I think I have just a, a couple of minutes. I, I'll wrap up. Um, I, I want to clarify that uh, it's not the case that this other option, these sort of parametrically radical causal models that are you know, structurally conservative, what people have called quantum causal models throughout the conference, it's not as if they're completely unproblematic and, and everything's done. This is, this is more, I would say, still a research program. So uh, I don't think we yet have a satisfactory causal explanation of, of Bell inequality violations. Um, and the reason is that I think you, you know, these parameters have to be interpreted in a very specific way. If I'm gonna think of the formalism of quantum mechanics as being uh, a kind, you know, th think of it from the causal modeling perspective, these ought to play the role of uh, you know, part of a theory of inference. Classically, they're conditional probabilities. They're, they're part of a framework of Bayesian probability theory. And, and so in the quantum case, we need to, we can't just declare by fiat that all this stuff can be thought of as, you know, how you should update your beliefs about one variable given other variables. You have to really show that that's the case. And that's what hasn't uh, been done. Uh, you know, there's been a sort of progression of ideas for how to do this. This, this third paper shows a kind of uh, uh, significant restriction on, on the possibility of doing that. Some of what John Barrett talked about and uh, what you'll find in, in, in these papers um, kind of improves on the situation, gets a bit further. But my perspective these days is that uh, all those attempts uh, could not have succeeded because there was a, a, an unscrambling of causal and inferential notions that still remains to be done, that there was still sort of a, a confusion between causation and inference that was persisting. Uh, and so I, I don't have time to talk about it, but um, there's a recent paper with David Schmidt and John Selby that, that tries to kind of uh, set uh, the research program in a new direction by sort of uh, articulating what further unscrambling needs to be done. Um, so let me, let me just finish by saying, you know, the, going back to the beginning, this is a bit of a description of, of, of what we're trying to achieve in, in this paper. Um, we're trying to achieve a, a realist account of quantum correlations. And, and what we mean by that is that we want a, a theory of causation, a theory of inference uh, that can explain the observed statistical correlations while salvaging this Leibnizian methodological principle and therefore you know, the spirit of locality and non uh, which are basically instances of that uh, principle. And essentially, you know, the way we do it is we say, well, the, the classical theory of, of what causation is, just like sets and functions, and the classical theory of what inference is, which is you know, Bayesian probability theory, Boolean logic, those need to be modified. Uh, we need to have some, some sort of uh, what I'll call intrinsically quantum uh, variants of those, and, and therefore an intrinsically quantum notion of realism. And it's that sort of framework uh, where I think we can achieve a, a satisfactory uh, causal explanation. So uh, that's it. Thanks very much for your attention.
Questions? So, you know, there's, there would be way too much to talk about, but let me just hit two points. Um, your Leibnizian principle, mm -hmm. um, sure, Newton violates it as soon as he postulates a Euclidean space because the Euclidean space has translational and rotational symmetries, which allow for ontologically distinct situations that are observationally indistinguishable. Um, he does it to explain the bucket and and Leibniz couldn't explain the bucket, right? I mean, Leibniz loses that particular yes, but debate. Barber and Bertotti but, but wait, yeah, and, took up and, Leibniz's argument. Hmm? I, th I think Barber and Bertotti did it. Yeah, I don't think Barber and Bertotti but Leibniz did it either, wins in but, the end. But again, the I don't want to get too far into that. If you say Einstein was using it, Einstein at the end of 1905 has flat Minkowski space time, which has translational and rotational symmetry, just like Newtonian absolute space. So you would say he violates the he he gets to a theory that violates it too, so th that's just historical. But I think I, I just I disagree with both those points. I just want to say that. You, I, okay, if you think yeah. Minkowski space flat Minkowski space no, time I, is not what special relativity gives you, okay, you have a no. I disagree with the idea that Einstein didn't endorse Leibniz's principle. I think if you look at Einstein's writing, he endorses I, it all over the place. What what I just said was that the theory he comes to violates it. But he didn't land with that theory. He landed with general relativity. And, Just like we landed with Barbara Bertotti in the end as the correct relational account of Newtonian. Yeah, uh, okay. So anyway, that would be. But the, the main thing is, look, um, of course it's surprising if there are non-local causal connections that you don't see non-local signal, right? That's surprising. And you might say, why is that? And the normal answer is in a Bohmian perspective because you're in quantum equilibrium. And just as in thermo, there are lots of really interesting thermodynamic principles that just, you know, you can explain all kinds of things and say, don't try to build this because it would violate the second law. But we know the, the, the standard account is the second law can be violated, right? You don't want to build that into the fundamental physics. What you do is explain why typically it won't be by statistical considerations. And that's just what happens. So I would say to that, that I think the, the version of an equilibrium argument that makes sense to me is the one that Valentini proposed, wherein there's this notion of, you know, that the particle configuration of biomechanics need not have been exactly psi squared. There could be deviations. And if that is one's point of view, then as, as I noted, it's possible in principle to adjudicate between that point of view using empirical data. My guess is that, you know, the experiments will continue to find that any such point of view that allows in principle for signaling, because it allows in principle for subquantum non-equilibrium, will actually be found to be, you know, overfitting the data. I, I don't think the experiments are going to support that point of view. So, the, 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 all right, so I, again, I'll, I'll just say this. I'm sorry if people can't follow this. From a Bohmian perspective, there's no initial distribution. There's a single point. There's one point, one initial configuration. And what the arguments show, and these are arguments that Shelley and Detlef and Nino gave, is that a typical initial point will give you born statistics on subsystems. A typical initial point. It doesn't have to be psi squared. How do I define typicality? Use psi to the fourth, use psi to the eighth. By any of those definitions, a typical initial point will give you born statistics. And so yeah, yeah I guess I, I personally, I, I don't find those typicality arguments to be persuasive. If, if you, you know, that there is something that, you know, has to go like psi squared, which is the probability distribution that describes, you know, what we know about the Bohmian configuration. And if you allow that to deviate from psi squared, then you're opening up the possibility for signaling. So I, I think we, we disagree about the status of, of those arguments. I mean, I, I'm on Valentini's side regarding that. Thanks, Rob, that was a really nice talk. Um, I share your sentiment that I don't think quantum causal models are all the way there to um, provide good descriptions of the Bell inequalities. And I'm just interested in um, whether you think uh, the kind of the direction that you're heading, part, if part of that project is to kind of explain the Cyrilson bound, for example, rather than PR boxes, whether that's part of it or whether that is yeah. a question that's kind of orthogonal to what you're doing. Thanks. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah, that, that's definitely a, a part of it that, uh, you know, I, I think the axiomatization trend in quantum foundations is, is absolutely uh, the, the right way to go. That I, I would characterize, you know, th there was a time where quantum foundations was, you know, very concerned with taking the quantum formalism as given and adding a story about reality to it. Whereas more recently, we've been trying to say, can we derive the details of the quantum formalism from some principles? And so sort of my take on that is that, you know, those principles are ultimately going to be about, uh, you know, the nature of causation and the nature of inference and how they're kind of slightly different in, in a quantum world compared to a, a classical world. And those are the principles by which we'll be able to derive the quantum formalism. And therefore, in particular, explain that we get just to the Searleson bound and, and, and no further than the Searleson bound. Um, so I, I think, you know, the reason that, that I think that's the, the sort of right approach to take is that a, a lot of the old interpretational stories like, you know, Bowman mechanics or Everett or collapse theories, you know, from a modern perspective, I can take those stories and I can look at a formalism that's different from quantum theory, like any, a generalized probabilistic theory, like box world or my toy theory or any of another, and you can add that story to them. So there's nothing about those stories that, you know, pick out the quantum formalism from among a number of other ways the world could have been. And so that, that to my mind, uh, makes it clear that, you know, that those stories clearly have less, uh, you know, power to explain why the world is quantum than an axiomatic derivation of the formalism starting from principles. Um, thanks. So there is a person who raised their hand online, so the person can maybe ask the question. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, well, uh, I have a, a question regarding uh, what else, uh, what is involved in this, uh, as you put it, the scrambling of the omelette of causation. I, I've seen your paper. <laughs> it's pretty long. I, I'm just curious to know what exactly do you think that um, needs to be done? Right. Yeah. What, what further unscrambling needs to yes. be done? Right. Um, so, you know, in, in the past, we, we focused on completely positive maps as kind of the, the, the quantum analog of conditional probabilities. And we thought, hey, conditional probabilities, those, those are, you know, like, like think of it as a stochastic matrix, P of B given A. We thought, oh, those are clearly just things that live in an inf inferential theory. They're, they're about your, you know, the inferences you can make about B given A. And, uh, you know, th there's, there's nothing problematic there. But what we realized in this work was that, um, if, if you have the following situation where I just have, you know, A is a bit and B is a bit, we want to say that, you know, that the causal connection that could connect A to B is just a function. And, and there's only four uh, different bit to bit functions. There's the, the constant function identity, there's the flip, and then there's, you know, reset the bit to zero, regardless of what value it had or reset the bit to one. That's it. Um, and now you could have knowledge about what that function is. So you might, for example, just, assign equal probability to it being identity or flip. That's one state of knowledge you might have. A second state of knowledge you might have is equal probability that it's reset to zero or reset to one. And it turns out that both of those states of knowledge, you know, that they, they have completely different support on, on the, you know, the, the function. So they, they're consistent with completely different uh, causal uh, relations in the world. Uh, in one case, identity and flip, A and B are causally connected. In the other case, they're causally disconnected they give the same stochastic matrix. They both uh, say that the stochastic matrix B given A is just you know, the, the randomizing channel. And so that's the sense in which these stochastic matrices, they, they scramble together causal and inferential concepts. If you just give me the stochastic matrix, I don't know whether it's ignorance about two ways that A and B might be causally connected or ignorance about two ways in which they may be causally disconnected. So, so that's why we think, you know, we, we ought not to focus on those stochastic matrices and the quantum analog of that, the CP map, that also we think, you know, therefore scrambles, you know, causal and inferential notions. And what we need on the quantum side is more like the analog of a probability distribution over function. That's the, the thing that we need to figure out on the quantum side. So I hope, I hope that I answers see. your question. Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again and all the speakers of this session. Yeah, so just to wrap up here, uh, I was saying to other people, um, I'd like to